Hi, I'm Peter Lindemann, Vice President of Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. I'm here together with Tom Brown at the headquarters of Borderland Sciences Research Foundation, hidden in the lost coast of Northern California, Redwood, what's left of the Redwoods. <laughs> um, we're here today to bring to you a tour of the Borderland Museum of Radionic Dowsing, Electrotherapeutic, and Related Research Equipment. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of history about Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. Borderland Sciences was first founded by Mead Lane in 1945. He remained director for about 14 years until 1959, at which time Riley Crabb took over and was director until 1984. 85. 85. Um, at which time Tom Brown took over. During that period, Borderland Sciences Research Foundation has continuously published a newsletter originally called Round Robin and is now called the Journal of Borderland Sciences. Borderland has been interested in unexplained and alternative technology since its inception. Part of what you're going to see today is a collection of equipment that has been donated to Borderland from the early days up to now, which has been in storage for many, many years. We're bringing everything out of storage to show you in a historical review development and the progress that has been made on a number of these very exciting alternative methods for uh, health enhancement and natural healing processes. Behind us here, we can see a picture of Albert Abrams, who can truly be termed the father of radionics. Uh, the preliminary name of the work of Abrams was called the ERA, or the Electronic Reactions of Abrams. And this dealt with uh, what you could call percussion, or rubbing a glass plate on a person's abdomen to uh, find out where there was energies that weren't in harmony with the whole self. And as Abrams advanced this work, he found that if he had a subject whose reactions he was used to and familiar with, he could connect his test subject up via a wire to his, his generally used subject and get the reactions through them. Now over time, he found that he could eliminate the test subject, the one that was used for the rubbing, but the detecting. The detecting person, correctly. Um, he found he could eliminate them by putting a series of resistors in line and eventually rubbing a glass plate which had a coil underneath it rather than rubbing a glass rod on the person's abdomen. Now in our collection we actually don't have any of Abrams' original equipment, although over the years I have seen various people that have had it. But we do have a quite extensive collection of his books and publications, some of which have been reprinted and are available to researchers. And here, perhaps, we can focus in on a diagram of the faceplate of what was called Abrams' Oscilloclast. And we have a photograph also of a slight variation on it, although they were all basically the same type of equipment. We have basically resistance decades all in line. So by changing the position of one of these dials changes a, a sequence of resistances which is wired through the back of the device. Right. Now, so of course the different settings then would produce what we call rates. And these rates over time could be related to specific diseases or um, uh, parts of the body. Right. And uh, also, Albert Abrams, and through some of his students, 
is actually the first person that discovered that rather than having the subject hooked up via wire to the rubbing plate, they could take a blood crystal and use that. And they found that the blood crystal contained all the radiations of the human body and a complete diagnosis of the body could be made from that. Dr. Pfeiffer, a student of Rudolf Steiner's, has developed this process of crystallization and in the Anthroposophical Movement they have published several of his books on sensitive crystallization processes. And Dr. Pfeiffer also helped develop the uh, biodynamic compost starter which crystallizes living forms in it. Um, the, the, the point is that all of the basic tenets of radionics as it's practiced today were developed by Abrams. Um, he developed the basic um, resistive uh, network, the uh, detection techniques using first rubbing a glass rod on somebody's abdomen and eventually rubbing um, what, what they realized is rubbing a piece of glass over someone's skin could be reversed and what they found was they could put a piece of skin or a thin membrane over a piece of glass and rub that and get the same uh, reaction. Uh, and this was the, the beginnings of the evolution of the, the rubbing plate or sometimes called the stick plate. Right. So they, he developed the the method of generating rates, and he, and he developed the, the method of detecting when you were on the right rate, which was the stick plate. Right. And if we miss a few of the finer points of Dr. Abrams' research, it's because it's so extensive and we have so much equipment that we want to show you on this video that we're just going to try to go through everything as fast as we can and start getting into some actual radionic equipment and dismantling it, showing, showing the Showing the schematics, etc. So I think what we'll do here is to show you some of the publications that we have in the files and also available to the researcher who wants to read up on this. Probably the, the best introduction is this book here, ERA, The Electronic Reactions of Dr. Abrams. This here is just the cover. The master is currently at the printer being reprinted. And this book is available in the Borderland catalog. It contains schematics of the equipment basic concepts on how to use it, and further articles on the subject. Now for those people who would like to delve a little further into the subject, we have here New Concepts in Diagnosis and Treatment by Albert Abrams, which has been published by Health Research in McCullumney Hill, California. About 400 pages and contains diagrams and full explanations and this is really major work of a Albert Abrams describing the electronic reactions and I should point out that Abrams did say as he was quoted by Dinshaw Gadiali in one of his publications that we're not civilized but we're syphilized and that all modern diseases originated in um, reactions of syphilis in the body is a very interesting concept that researchers should look into. Now here is uh, another book published by Health Research called Human Energy by Albert Abrams. Um, and this is a smaller book but still contains a lot of essential information on it. Then when we open up this book here. This one's called Abrams Method of Diagnosis and Treatment. This is an original copy. Right, this is in the Borderland Files. And we have reprinted it in uh, this format here. This is by Sir James Barr. And I believe it contains articles by several other people also on the subject of Abrams' work. And it's a thorough investigation of it. This was originally printed in 1925. Right. Uh, and this book here is a very interesting book, which I republished and found in my researches. The full title is Certain Body Reflexes in Their Relation to Certain Radiant Energies and a Third Report of the International Hahnemannian Committee on the Abrams Method of Diagnosis and Treatment presented at the annual meeting of the IHA, Philadelphia, July 1926. 
And this is a report of mechanical engineers and doctors and electrical engineers who thoroughly investigated the Abrams method and found that there definitely was a distinct and novel energy in these being manipulated by this type of equipment. So the Hahnemannian association would be in relationship to homeopathy. homeopathy. Hahnemann was the father of homeopathy several hundred years earlier. Correct. I don't know the exact date right off. So basically, um, here is uh, a report uh, demonstrating the early relationship and interest of the homeopaths with uh, what became the radionic method. Right, and I should point out that I found other reports like this, and I'm in the process of compiling a book, which will probably be out in late 1989, as yet untitled, but it contains reports by a man named Boyd, a man named Ellis, and several other people who uh, developed equipment related to Abrams, and also some other further reports on Abrams' work by independent laboratories. So we're in the process of putting more of this information out. And here we have from our files, used to belong to a Dr. Leonard Chapman from Vista, and this is Dr. Abrams Atlas. And this is basically put together by copyright 1940 by Thomas Colson. Thomas Colson was Albert Abrams' electrical engineer and built a lot of the equipment. And uh, we want to just show you okay. one, one uh, situation here, this little diagram which shows the human being standing with a foot plate here and an attachment to his head and then in between him is a sequence of variable resistors which fundamentally um, represents the, the, the panel of, of the device and then this was probably the detector uh, with some sort of compensator involved in that, which is in parallel with the rest of the circuit. So this, this gives you a very simple idea of the nature of the circuitry that was being used. Right. Maybe we could flip through the couple pages back here. Um, we may reprint this book also if there's interest in it. We just haven't, just can't reprint everything. We have so much. But this shows the human abdomen and it shows little sections. And here we see burns, radium, in a rate of D3700. And here's boracic acid dissipates, D600, D3400. So these are the positions on the abdomen and rates as they were used by Abrams. And some of these pictures are in some of the books that we've already shown you that are in print. So here's a situation where he can detect. This is death, actually. This is a death rate for male and female is it opposing polarity in the abdomen. And interestingly enough, here's dandruff. The, right. dan yeah, the dandruff detection point is right here underneath <laughs> the navel. Fascinating work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And this book here, Molecular Radiations by Thomas Coulson, also printed by Health Research, and all these Health Research books are also available through Borderland, and we'll give Health Researchers address as we go through the video because they've really done a fantastic job in reprinting a lot of this old material themselves. And um, we'll put, give their address for people who want to check out. They've published over a thousand books themselves in contra contradistinction to about the 80 that we've published in this area. And also at the printer right now is another book by Thomas Coulson we have called Introduction to Electronic um, Therapy. It's a smaller book which probably predates this one here and has basic schematics and rates in there. So that would be a pretty handy uh, primer for people that want to uh, work on this equipment. And one interesting thing about Thomas Coulson is he was the editor of what was called the Electronic Medical Digest, which grew out of the work of Albert Abrams and the early radionics pioneers. But not so much radionics, but we could say the ERA, Electronic Reactions Pioneers. Now in the late 40s, we have a collection of the old Electronic Medical Digest in our files. And very interestingly, after Second World War, they start orienting towards nuclear medicine 
there's actually articles in there about how we would the deserts would bloom with nuclear power in the future and of course we're of a slightly different opinion today on that but we should note that Fred Hart who took over the publication from Thomas Coulson later turned that publication into uh, the what's now the Health Freedom News published by the National Health Federation which was founded by Fred Hart who was a student of Albert Abrams Uh, there were several offshoots of uh, Albert Abrams' work, and we thought we'd show a couple of those here. The book that Peter's holding is called Electronism, Diagnosis and Treatment by B.W. Lindbergh, C-E-M-D-D-O. And the date on that is 1929. And this is basically very similar to Abrams' equipment. The book is dedicated to Albert Abrams. And I don't know how good this will show up, but here's a basic, uh, it's kind of interesting picture, electronic diagnosis. Shows one, two, three, four, five banks of resistors. There's a magnet over the person's head. Here's the doctor rubbing something on the person's stomach while they hold an uh, electrode. electrode to their head. They're probably standing on another electrode. Very possibly. Oh, and very and this, this book here is about 600 pages with about five pages of text and 600 pages of rates. And chances are nil that we'll ever reprint this because the equipment no longer exists and the rates probably wouldn't work on anything. Or if any researchers ever really did need any of this material, you know, we can always make it available to those that want it. And that's our purpose of uh, doing this video, is to get the information available. What we wanted to show with this book was that by 1929, an extremely extensive system of rates for every little part of the body muscle tendons, right hand, neck, upper quadrant, lower quadrant, wrist, fingertips, on and on and on and on and on, and just, just massive, extensive, on and on, you know, this is great good, systems. This is a good book to read when you want to go to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's worse than the telephone book, really. So um, the thing is, is that by 1929, the system of rates had been highly developed. All right. And there's a couple other interesting offshoots of this work. One was that was called the Pathoclast, and we publish here the Pathoclast Instruction Book for Model 9C with schematics. And this shows the front panel of the instrument, how to operate it. We have a little photograph of the instrument here, which is not a real good photograph, but it's all we have in the files of it. But the book has complete schematics, rates, and how to use it, and several type of people would be interested in this book. We get requests from people who find the old equipment, want to know what to do with it, how to repair it, get it working. Some people just like to read about this type of material, and some people like to try to reconstruct it in their researches. Although we feel that we're going to show further developments which may uh, you know, remove the need for building any of this type of thing. And here's the Pathometric Journal, Universal Society of Pathometrists. And this was actually, maybe we can flip through. Um, this is the Pathometric Journal, various ones from 1940 to 47. This was just a regular little newsletter that came out for the people, because this was all done all over. There's offices, there's major offices in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Kansas City, quite a bit in Kansas, interestingly enough. I always hear stories of stashes of radionic equipment in barns in Kansas, although we haven't seen any. <laughs> so this gives you an idea that this, this, uh, this is uh, June 47. Here's an ad for 1947 Convention of the Universal Society of Pathometrists, LA, California, August 14th through 17th, 1947. Convention Chairman, Dr. James Fitches. I should point out that although radionics and these fields are considered quackery by present-day medical establishment. At this point in time, Albert Abrams was one of the highest decorated doctors at the turn of the century, but he lost all his standing when he, you know, he became original, which always happens with the original person. But these people were all doctors. They were trained medical people. Or today, a lot of radionics is in the hands of the average person that just wants to find out what's going on and build things and try things out. And, knows the world's a little different than they tell them on TV. But back then, this was a very serious um, medical practice. 
Exactly. Um, it be, was it was well respected in the the this this newsletter, um, you know, was had a, a a fairly decent circulation, and there was a way of since this was an experimental um, modality uh, in medicine at the time, uh, this was one way of uh, getting. Uh, information out to all the people who were using the method. Right. And um, this was continued, uh, uh, you know, for, for many years. And then there was another uh, offshoot of this same type of instrumentation. It was called the Auto Electronic Radio Clast. And here's the instruction manual. It was designed by Dr. J.G. Miller. And we don't have any schematics in this book. But the information on the structure of disease in the body is very essential, and for radionic researchers, I would definitely recommend this book. Uh, we've probably sold 10 copies in the last two years, mainly because nobody really knows what it is. But it is a very good book for researchers that are interested in it. If you can see on this diagram, this is, this is uh, another development of the basic um, style, M multiple uh, resistive uh, uh, bank dials with a, a detector plate here on the on the front panel. That in this case, this was a really nice tabletop model with this drawer that pulled out that had the detector on it, and it would go back in. So they were uh, they were working with different designs, and uh, the radio class was built for a number of years. All right. And the stories of all these are in a publication, which I'll pull over here. This is an old copy. This is undergoing revision, currently out of print, and called Radionics, the New Age Science of Healing, edited by Riley Hansard Crabb. First part, history and development of radionics. And uh, second part, radionics instruments and how to make them. Modified drone circuit. We're going to get into Ruth Drawn next and talk about her has an atlas of rates and has an interview with Dr. Leonard Chapman. Now this book has been a very popular book but in some ways it was very dated and it's undergoing revision now and we're putting a lot of new information in, a lot of corroborating data, new schematics, um, and typesetting it so it's easier to read at the same time. But basically this, this original um, history and development of radionics that Riley put together is um, probably uh, a very good overview of the development of, of the radionic method and, and the various people who contributed to the early developments. It was actually ran as a serial in the Journal of Borderland Research in the late 60s, early 70s and was condensed into this book. And then compiled. It yeah. was written by anonymously by a person who called himself, himself or herself the radionicist. Oh, the radionicist, right. Um, so this will be available probably late 1989 for researchers who are interested in that. And I believe at this point we're going to move on to Ruth Drown. So no, no, we're going to show you this. Oh yes, we forgot our favorite boat anchor. This this is one of the developments that came along after the radio class. This is called the Calbro Magna Wave, and uh, this is the first this is the first time you see the word radionics right on the device. There's a beautiful panel here. And uh, here we see bipolar control treatment, diagnosis, and then you get the various banks for getting the resistance. And the name up here says hemodimagnometer. I'm not sure what that means, but there it is. And here's the emanator. This screening rays, white, red, green. Yellow. And this is very interesting. I, th I think we should, this opens up and we should try to show this. So here's a different colored light that so this would turn on and there's a basket weave type of coil in here and here's another coil that fit in mm -hmm. and there's little clips on here that would apparently clip onto a vial that went in for um, probably diagnosis and whatever so let's turn around and show the back of it it's this is potted it came out the story on this one is it was donated to us somebody took it out of the cabinet because they wanted to build a stereo in the cabinet so they clipped all the wires and uh, basically destroyed it, but we kept it. It's potted in thick potting compound. We'll never know what's inside it. Yeah, but we we imagine that these are um, variable resistors. Um, at, at up to this time, it was the primary method 
these are listed as hundredths, tens, units, oh, hundreds, tens, units, tenths, hundredths, and thousandths. So they, they thought that they were... Um, so basically zero point, three digits on each side of the decimal point. Mm -hmm. and that. So this is, um, this is typical of what uh, an old device um, looks like. This is circa what, 40s? I would estimate around there. Okay. Um, and it was probably in a very nice wood cabinet. It was. And it was probably also... Um, it, it had other attachments. It had a little wood piece that came out with rubbing plates, and it had various hookup pieces. And right. The detector would plug in here. Right. And control, high and low switches. I, I got a call from somebody that uh, had one of these, and they called up and said they had it, and we could have it for $750, and if we couldn't get the $750 in two weeks, they would take it to the dump. So I hung up the phone and we thought we'd just keep this one here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now we're going to go on to uh, Ruth Drown and the developments that came after that. Now we're going to take a look at the work of Ruth Drown. Ruth Drown is a very interesting figure in the history of radionics, and we publish a lot of her material and are currently working on projects, you know, to further carry on her material. And we have a lot of her actual equipment, so we're going to start putting equipment up on the bench here that we know something about. And first of all, we'll run through some of her books. Here, here's a book published in 1939 called The Theory and Technique of the Drown Homo Vibraray and radio vision instruments. The Homo Vibraray was um, basically a nine dial radionic instrument. Ruth Drown standardized to nine dials, which she attributed to the nine cephra on the tree of life. And all her rates, interestingly enough, when you add them up numerologically, the corresponding organs or sections of the body would correspond to ancient attributes of the body to the Hebraic Tree of Life. And here's our reprint of the book, Theory and Technique of the Drown HVR and Radio Vision Instruments, which is actually the first book I ever reprinted um, as I started out before I took over Borderland. And this pretty much details the whole process of using the drown equipment, how to make a blueprint of the body, and how it was used in actual clinical practice. Now, I also mentioned radio vision. Ruth Drown is able to take radio vision photographs of internal organs using blood spots. Yeah, here we go, chapter two, Making a Blueprint of the Body. Lectures given by Ruth Drown, March 1932. Ruth Drown worked out in Los Angeles up until the early 60s when she was put out of business by the FBI, who considered her a quack, even though she had been documenting cures and real groundbreaking work for the 30s to 60s, you know, over a quarter of a century. And this book, now that Peter's flipping through, is a rate atlas that we carry. Also, I just wanted to show the patent. She got a British patent on her radio vision device, that, which was capable of taking photographs of the inside of the body without cutting you open. All right. And she was granted a British patent on this system which that was, this was called the radio vision. Uh, you know, while you're flipping through there, I'll find some radio vision photographs here. We have more. Trevor, Con Trevor James Constable has a lot of the radio vision photographs, and we hope to get them to BSRF in the future. Here are some of the figures from the patent application. And this predated the DeLoire camera thought photography in England. And here we have this photo, photograph of the diseased prostate gland lobule taken from blood specimen compared with photograph of histological structure of a prostate gland lobule. This here is the radio vision photograph, just using a crystal of blood in the well of her machine. And this is a medical picture of the relationship of it. 
And I've seen dozens of her photographs. Some of them, I'll admit, it's hard to figure out what's going on, where other ones are extraordinarily dramatic in the detail they show of internal organs. Here's a photograph of the radiovision device. I believe the film went into the drawer. There's your basic nine dials. And we also publish here the science and philosophy of the drawn radiotherapy, which is a brief and interesting book on the subject. It's interesting in this book here, which I believe was published in 38. You can flip it open and take a look. Los Angeles, 1938. There's a picture of her in there. In this book, Ruth Drown talks about a pulse of the earth at seven and three quarters a second. Seven and three quarters time per second. Now, the Schumann ionosphere resonance was supposedly discovered what, in the late 50s, early 60s. Here's a book from 1938, and we reprinted this from the original that Trevor Constable lent us for that purpose. And she discusses it in there. So. Far from being the quack that she was claimed in the uh, establishment press, she was actually an advanced scientist far beyond you know, what the medical profession even has an inkling of today. At her trial, um, over 150 people uh, witnessed in her defense that she had saved their lives, and they threw her in jail anyway. Right, well, I have a, there's an anecdote to this. I have a letter in the files uh, the Trevor Constable sent to uh, Riley Crabb back in the 1960s, or so maybe 60, 61. And Trevor had gotten a letter from his mother down in Wellington, New Zealand, and she wasn't feeling well. So Trevor had some of her blood crystals, took him to Dr. Drown's office, had an immediate diagnosis done of his mother from halfway across the world, and the letter in the files is just amazing. You know, the exuberance of Trevor talking about this wonderful new breakthrough in science is all here. And within two years, she was put out of business, you know, arrested in her home without a, they had a warrant for her place of business. And they came into her home illegally and took her out and took her to her place of business. And um, apparently people just couldn't grasp what she was getting at. But anyway, um, we want to, at this time, uh, show you some of the actual equipment that she was using. This this device this was an... not built by her, but it is a reproduction, pretty classical reproduction, uh, from what we can tell, uh, of her standard device. She had nine basic, uh, what are called the, the rates tuning dials. She's got the rubbing plate and what uh, this would call a specimen well. Right, and there's three little plugs here. One went to ground. One went to uh, plates on the feet. Silver foot plates. And the other went to a plate on the abdomen. Right. So that she, she, when she wasn't using a specimen, like a blood spot or something, to do the diagnosis, she would actually connect the person she was working on directly to the device. Right. Well, there's actually several modifications of it in Trevor's book, Cosmic Pulse of Life, he shows the basic diagram of the, the feet go on the silver foot plate and uh, whatever the energy comes in through the body and comes through then through the foot plate and into the instrument in a single wire circuit which we've explored single wire circuits in some of our electrical videos but not never in relation to electronics here. Or what I'd like to do stuff. here is we've taken the back off of this and show you because this is this is such a classic radionic device. How's the reflection on that? Is that okay? We can, we can probably get away with... Uh, okay. Um, basically you can see that um, from from the inputs here... This is ground. The center one is ground because the rubbing plate went to ground. Okay, so, so, so the energy from the ground would go to the center of the rubbing plate and then on into the rest of the circuitry. And as you can see here, it goes to a number of different locations from here. But what I'd like to show you basically is that from uh, one of the plates that attaches to the body, you go to the specimen well, and to this, this top dial, which is then connected to the next one, and the next one, and then 
to the next one, next one, next one, and then to the next one, next one, next one. And then from here, it goes to the rubbing plate, and then through this little switch, and then back to the other body part. So as you can see that the body's energy is brought all the way through the tuning device, through the specimen well, and through the rubbing plate, all as a part of the basic circuit. And there are other, other uh, wiring arrangements here which um, are parallel circuits as we showed you from the book on Abrams, where the rubbing plate was parallel to the other sections. Right. So this is I this is a classic device. I believe I have a schematic right here of this device, which should be fairly easy to show also. And this is the actual device which is pictured in our book, Drawn Radio Vision and Home of Vibrary Instruments and Their Uses, which contains an 80-page rate atlas, all the various rates. But here's a schematic. You see foot plates, German silver. On this one there was a meter coming through into the specimen well. Now if you didn't, weren't hooked up to the subject, you would just use a blood crystal in the specimen well. Then simply through here, a simple one wire circuit into rubbing plate. One went to a treatment plate and one went to ground. Slight variation on what we're looking at here, but... But almost you, identical. You see the bases, it's all built around nine dials. What this diagram doesn't show is this little switch here. Right. And that's just about all. Okay, well, so what we'll pull up next here is a treatment instrument, which was used in combination with this other piece we were showing. Um, dials are slightly old on here. This was kept in a shed down by the ocean in Southern California. And the, the state of this equipment is all slightly corroded. It will never be used again for any type of radionic work, but it's available for... It's reflecting. Oh, it's reflecting. It's available for people who want to uh, take it apart and see how it worked, and that's why we kept it. So, so basically what you have here is a basic nine-dial tuner with an on-off switch, a specimen well, and your in-and-out system. Right, but this is strictly a treatment. Right, so there's no rubbing plate, so you can't right. get an indication on this device. Right. But you can... You s set a rate for treatment. Right. And this is three bank. So he, she could be treating three different people. Right. We have pictures of some of the old electron, old radionics books in the files where there's actually walls of these things. And have a picture of a nurse, you know, tending you know, thousands of dials. <laughs> so this is this is one of the uh, early developments. Again, um, this is a variation on the diagnostic device. This is this is purely a treatment device and it shows the development of the multiple treatment device in the sense that once we diagnosed, now we can treat a number of different people once we know what to do. So here is a, a basic three-panel three drown device. Now this device here was donated to us by Trevor James Constable. And... Um, we have a little card that came with this? Uh, yeah. This is called the Zog instrument. And uh, the little card that was taped inside says Dr. Arthur Zog, DC, Doctor of Chiropractic, Electrotherapy by appointment only, Los Angeles. And what this is, it's a, we could say it's a modified drown, five bank. For testing, treating, for each each one of the different systems, he's got uh, in and outs here. He's got uh, looks like these are colors: oh. yellow, green, blue, violet, white, and red, and so on. For each channel, he's also got a rubbing plate down here, and a sequence of switching so that he can plug into any one of these things. These are probably specimen wells of some sort, right? So that he can uh, a little clip here too, so. Probably had different attachments, and pretty much a lot of the people that did these all had their own little original attachments that would go with it in their own way, especially in the equipment that people built themselves, because in essence, the equipment is an extension of the person's healing ability in a way. So this is 
Well, we can look at like the electronic medicine of Colson, where they started even thinking that nuclear medicine might be what was happening. At the same time, completely independent of that was this work of Ruth Drown, which got away from the electronic equipment and went into just the body's energies flowing through the equipment, as we see with this type of equipment. Mm -hmm. So this was probably early 60s, late 50s piece here. And uh, when we turn it around, just take a basic look at the circuit. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, he's got some notes up here. And one of them is he's got a bunch of different cell salts. He's got rates for the cell salts listed up here, plus bioplasm. There's an interesting little uh, parable here, which is kind of hard to read because it's not all there. It says, work, uh, work upon marble, it will crumble. Work upon brass, it will rust. Work upon temples, time will efface them. Work upon people, the results will last. That good philosophy for a radionicist. We'll take a look at the uh, interior of this. This plugged into the wall, which Ruth Drown's equipment completely uh, stayed away from electricity. Well, I have seen some Ruth Drown equipment that had like little uh, oscilloscope screens on. And but what we'll, what we'll see here is how this, um, this has a little transformer and a plug, but uh, if you remember on the uh, front here, um, there were a bunch of indicator lights. Uh, most of these devices are set up so that the electricity comes in and runs the indicator lights and isn't really a part of the radionic circuit. Although it is here because uh, the electricity, one side of the electricity attaches to the wells. No, these, these, well, are, the color uh, these are color lights. Right. Yeah, these are lights for color dials. Okay, now one of the reasons for electricity in is there was something called the fundamental ray, which I believe was first worked out in British radionic equipment, at least from my understanding of it. And in some of the early uh, Bruce Copen equipment, there was a dial to direct to the fundamental ray of the uh, subject being treated. And they used electricity, one side of an electric wire. They'd plug both in, but only one side would be connected, and that would ground out to eliminate the need for the fundamental ray dial. We've got three wires here. This is uh, Probably a for a grounding wire. You can see it just goes to a little thing here that was meant to be attached to a pipe or something. So this, this uh, gives you another idea. This is probably resistance wire that's soldered on all the way around here to give you a net resistance. And right. then this is a multiple position click switch. Very cleanly built instrument. Yeah. Very nice. <clears throat> okay, and uh, then we'll pull up on the bench here some equipment that belonged to Dr. Leonard Chapman from Vista, California. And this first instrument that I'm bringing up here is a modified drown instrument. And uh, the second one is a treatment instrument developed by Dr. Chapman called the Chapman Low-Level Polarizer. Now this is in the radionics book I showed earlier, Radionics New Age Science by Riley Crabb. It's a schematic for a modified drown, whereas this one is slightly different from the schematic this was the actual one in use by Dr. Chapman. I want to show you the back of this here. Um, here's the rubbing plate. This is kind of curious because it goes to this dial, then here, 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 then up to here, and here, then here, here, and here. No, no, first to here, oh. then to here, and here, and here. First to this oh, one. Well, no, that loops back around, right. I started here and right. through and then back to here, which is another dial. Yeah, so this is a so, variable resistor, and right. then back to these fixed resistors. This is a slightly different setup, and we've never and used this. And then to this well, the specimen well, and then to this one. And what's interesting here is um, then this is connected to one terminal, actually the center tap, the center tap of this output transformer. Mm -hmm. The output then um, goes to run this light bulb, period. Right, which is, which is just the indicator or just on the indicator. It's just the on light. Or, or so the plug basically runs the on light, and then the radionic circuit is attached to the center tap, and then terminates at the rubbing plate, 
So obviously, it's not a complete circuit. It would be. This is among the reasons why most of these things have been considered the works of quacks and wackos, because in in terms of um, electricity and electronic circuits and so on. This is a nonsense circuit. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't come from anywhere. There's no way to get any electricity from here to there because it's not a closed circuit. Unless you're working with Tesla currents, which operate very similar to natural energy but, themselves. But, but we know that this yeah. kind of transformer can't generate that kind of yes, thing. Yes. Uh, one thing also, it's not on here, and it's really not in any of the instruments that we've seen here, um, but a lot of them had light bulbs that went underneath the rubbing plate to create heat to make it easier to get the stick. You know, the plate is rubbed and when you get to a certain point you actually get like an electrostatic stick. So this looks like a piece of uh, mahogany on top of a copper plate. Right. And it would be rubbed with clove oil also which these, this particular one came with a couple of bottles of clove oil that was apparently used to rub in and help give the stick, which may have been Dr. Chapman's personal technique or may have had wider acceptance. Mm -hmm. And this here is just basically a coil inside here. It's plugged in and we haven't had this one open. The screws are potted and wanted to keep it intact. It has several switches on it. Not really sure what they all do. But in the Radionics New Age Science book, it has a basic schematic for this. And Chapman would find her what was going on in diagnosis on this and then would set just a single rate from 0 to 100, put the person's witness in there and then simply broadcast it. So this is simply a broadcast treatment device and it was known as the Chapman Low-Level Polarizer. Chapman obviously felt he was getting good results with this equipment. He has an interview with Dr. Chapman in the book, as we noted earlier. And we should point out, all this development has pretty much taken place in the United States up to this point here. Although we'll, we'll be showing some of the British work. And here's a book, My Search for Radionic Truths, by R. Murray Denning. And uh, Murray Denning uh, passed on last November, 1988. He was rather elderly, and this was a publication of Borderland Sciences. This is our first paper back in 44 years. And Murray Denning was a champion of the Ruth Drown School over in England, which uh, pretty much developed its own schools, which we're going to cover in the next little section here. And if we can focus in on this, here's author's new diagnostic and treatment instruments. So he developed along the lines of Ruth Drown, his own system, based on it. Alongside the development for uh, human health, there was also a movement that started in the 30s and went on through the 40s and 50s of the development of these type of radionic devices for the treatment of plant illnesses. One of the uh, most famous of these developments uh, here is a schematic of what was called at the time the Yukako device. UKA company, um, UK, um, the U stand for a gentleman named Upton, who was an early member of Borderland Sciences Research Foundation and a friend of Mead Lane. And this was one of his developments with a gentleman named Knuth. And we should point out that this is in Jerry Gallimore's Handbook of Unusual Energies, but that the schematic does come out of the Journal of Borderland Research, which for over 40 years has been a real primary source of this type of information for researchers. By the way, for those we said before, here's the address for health research. It's 70 Lafayette Street. Actually, it should be P.O. Box 70 is the correct mailing address for them. And it's Mokelumne Hill. M O K E L U M N E Hill, California, nine five two four five. And it wouldn't hurt to send those guys a couple dollars for their catalog and see all the great stuff they publish. So anyway, we have one of the original Yukako devices here in the museum, and as you can see, this was a this was a full-on plug-in type of device. And it had a number of vacuum tubes in it and a couple of power supplies. It basically, is an amplifier. 
And what would happen is that you'd take, a lot of people have probably heard of these experiments, there's even experiments done by the Navy of this sort, where a photograph was taken of a field, an aerial photograph, and in the field, the photograph was sprayed with insecticide then placed on this. On the screen here, the screen area. Right, and then the instrument was just turned on and let to broadcast. And a lot of the bugs died. And there was test cases done with this where a corner of the photograph was cut off and the same process undertaken. And all the bugs that didn't die made it over into the corner of the field that was clipped off. Some very, very fascinating stuff. This, this, this research, went on for years and years. Uh, it, they, they had a number of tests um, in California that were so successful that the oil companies lobbied the government in Sacramento to outlaw the, uh, the commercial use of radio broadcasting for the treatment of um, uh, plants. Agriculture. Agriculture. And there, uh, California is the only uh, state in the union at this point that has that still has laws on the books from the early 50s, which outlaw the commercial use of this type of thing. One interesting thing about this type of uh, instrument that I'd like to point out is that you're actually broadcasting insecticide. You put an ad vibration into the ether. Now, Peter Kelly, in a talk he gave before the U.S. Psychotronics Association, probably about four or five years ago, talked about experiments they were doing with a um, type of device originally um, pioneered by T. Gale and Hieronymus. And they found in their treatment of fields, like they had a field of corn that was infected with a corn borer. And they would find the rate, just as you would find a rate on a drown instrument, and then they would broadcast a balancing rate I'm not sure whether it was the same rate or whether they, they had an overlapping rate onto that, but they would broadcast the own field's own energy back to it to balance it. And rather than the bugs all dying like they did with the Yukeko device here, they found that the corn borers would actually, would actually dissolve and be brought back into the plant in the form of water, which shows that the disease, whether it be bugs in a field or any other type of manifestation, is really just you know, whatever appears as the symptoms is really just part of the natural field which is out of phase. And radionics works with the subtle energy and phases and tries to bring things back into phase in that. So personally, I don't like this type of instrument. I'm, I'm much more in favor of the balancing type of instruments. And although we do have a book on this in the files, I probably won't reprint it, you know, with a schematic just because I don't think people should be broadcasting insecticide, in my personal opinion. Now, we did do a test on this when we first took over Borderland down in Vista, California, and we took some leaves from a plant that was covered with ants, and I just sprayed some black flag or some type of uh, insecticide on like that, and we put it on here and flipped it on. Within 20 minutes, all the ants were off that plant, and the ones around were walking real slow. So we had uh, definite visual confirmation that this worked. And the story of this device is in the Radionics New Age Science book, and when the new edition's out, at least the story of this, for historical purposes, will be available for people. Right. This was one of the um, devices that was so successful that it caused a considerable backlash. <laughs> because if you can kill a bug, you can theoretically kill anything. And you know. The implications of this were pretty incredible. Right. It's sad to say that uh, not everybody in this planet is of the highest moral caliber these days, so it's best that this type of information, how to readily build and use these things, is given out. We just don't do it anymore. One of the things we also wanted to show here is the some of the other parallel developments. This again is from the uh, Handbook of Unusual Energies by J.G. Gallimore. And um, uh, Jerry Gallimore at one time also uh, built and sold commercially uh, various styles of radionic devices, this being one of them. Right. This was called the RAU-2, which stood for Radionic Agricultural Unit. And this was slightly different. Um, didn't have a rubbing plate. What it had is you have here a little glass rod that has two electrodes on it. And this is then attached onto the hand. 
using rubber bands. And there's a 9 volt battery that goes on here and you hold your hand quite steady, as steady as you can. And you will turn it on and you'll set. There's no battery in now. I can never get this thing to work myself. But you turn to mid-dial. Then you'll put the plant specimen or whatever in here and turn the knobs and find the rate of whatever it is you're looking for. And what would happen is that as, as you found the rate, the skin resistance between these two electrodes would change and it would show on the dial. And so this was another type of indicator that was experimented with. Right, working with the electrostatic potential of the body. Now when I talked to Jerry Gallimore and told him that I had worked with this unit and couldn't get it to work, and he laughed and he said, well, I'll have to get out there someday and show you how to use it. But Jerry passed on last year at a rather young age, and um, this is now probably just going to sit here in our museum. Right. Uh, another, another set of developments um, by a brilliant man who did a, an astronomical amount of research. Uh, this, this book represents you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of his personal notes. Uh, there were eventually a number of other volumes that followed this right. one. That's volume number one of three. One of three, and it's you know just uh, hundreds of pages thick of all the different things that he looked into. Just uh, you can learn an awful lot <laughs> by paging through. <laughs> he covered everybody from von Reichenbach and his early indications with human energy on through radionics, and Jerry also founded the. Uh, uh, what was it, the U.S. Radionics Congress, which over the years somewhat changed course and became U.S. Psychotronics, but in its pure form originally, it was really a vibrant operation. Right. Jerry, Jerry uh, instituted the first um, <coughs> Radionic National Convention. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, which um, then institutionalized itself and called itself the USPA, or the U U United States Psychotronics Association. Right, with psychotronics being distinctly different from radionics, although there is quite a blurring in t today's modern definitions. So one of the things we wanted to show you here also in this book is another is the work of another man, T. Gallen Hieronymus, and his famous, uh, what was called the Hieronymus machine. This is a simple schematic of what he says here, how to build your own psionic machine. Psionic was a term actually developed by John Campbell, I believe, of Analog Magazine. So you get psionics, radionics, psychotronics, but the pure stream of radionics is distinctly one form. So what, what um, Hieronymus was doing, he had, a, he had a triangular piece of crystal basically a, a small prism in a chamber and by changing the angle of this prism he would take the radiations from a uh, collecting plate here which had this antenna this this flat square antenna system on underneath it run it through his little amplifying circuit and by turning the the crystal he could get an indication And which which uh, represented the tuning, right? It was actually patented as a mineral analyzer. Exactly. So where you could say you're looking for gold, and you take your ore, put it into your. Uh, this is the rubbing plate here. So the ore, the sample probably went into this end here. You would tune this and rub the plate. His patent he had uh, resistance decade box also. I want to come back here to this chart, nuclear weight factor versus prism angle. So, uh, and Hieronymus termed this energy eloptic radiation for electrical optical and was able to scientifically verify it over many years of work. Uh, T. Gale and Hieronymus was another uh, radionics pioneer who uh, passed on last year, it seemed to be the year for it. Um, and here's his autobiography, which just came out, called The Story of Eloptic Energy, the Autobiography of an Advanced Scientist, Dr. T. Galen Hieronymus. 
And uh, it's a very interesting book. It's got more of a family album feel than anything, but it does have a lot of his reports tracking the astronauts. He was able to track the astronauts to the moon and release reports to the public on their health state. You know, while it was before before NASA could before NASA could and knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, well, there's really no schematics in this book. It's a very interesting book. Um, correspondence with everybody. And for those who are interested in getting this book, it's published, it was compiled and edited by Dr. Sarah Williams Hieronymus, and is published by Institute of Advanced Sciences, Post Office Box 109, Lake Mont, Georgia, 30552. And I believe the book's about $30 plus postage and handling. And they want to, you want to write first and find out more about it. Mm -hmm. um, this is certainly the definitive work of um, a very, very distinguished uh, researcher in the field. Right. And one very important thing about Hieronymus's work is, that, and it's detailed in here, is how Hieronymus didn't use the, uh, or he began working with resistance type boxes and switched to capacitors in his tuning devices in this book, he gives his reasoning for it. So it's very important to radionic researchers to, who are interested in that development and changeover in the United States. Exactly. So up until this time, uh, all the devices that we've been seeing and talking about uh, were banks and banks of, of variable or, or fixed resistances. Hieronymus was the first to move to uh, a different mode which was a sequence of variable capacitors. And um, we'll talk more about this uh, system later. Meanwhile, uh, in Europe, there were a number of major developments also going on simultaneously with the work in the United States. As we showed, uh, what you're looking at now is a reproduction of a photograph of a device that was developed by Delaware Laboratories. Uh, George and his wife, uh, Marianne, I believe, Marjorie, Marjorie. Um, Delaware uh, were radionic pioneers in the 40s and the 50s. And again, as you can see, this is a, a, one of their devices. Uh, it's a variable resistive bank with witness uh, or specimen wells and a rubbing plate for the indicator showing that they started out with uh, very similar developments as Ruth Drown. A different geometric configuration of the dials. Right. But very similar. Very similar basic wiring schematic. As we've seen of the ones we have opened, um, the, uh, the wiring diagrams uh, are slightly different in each one uh, depending on the uh, the design of the builder. One of the other things that uh, Delaware was doing was also similar to uh, the Drown radio vision was he was getting photographs uh, through his radionic devices. And admittedly these are very poor photographs. By the way this book is New Worlds Beyond the Atom by Langston Day. Year unknown. This was obviously the first edition typed up, and I believe there's been better editions done since then in England, but this is what we have in our files. And we see here, pregnancy of Mrs. A taken on rape for one month fetus. And I don't know how well this can be seen, probably not too well, but you can actually see the shape, the primary, from the yin-yang, you can see the half, the white shape, which follows it. Then here's two months. For two months, and you can see a the fetus forms a little more. Three months, it's I can barely see this, so I doubt if the watcher can, but we can see the development. In six months, it's developing even further. So they're basically representing that they can take photographs of things that are inside your body, similar <coughs> to the types of um, developments that uh, Ruth Drown was saying she could do. I believe Ruth Drown predated this. Ruth Drown's cameras did predate the Delaware work. Uh, but again, here's verification that another group working independently uh, was able to come up with similar results using very similar systems. Right. 
So uh, Delaware Laboratories was certainly one of the uh, pioneers in radionics uh, in, in the 40s and 50s. Um, I'd like to interject this. Here's a book that we've republished because it was so good that um, I really wanted to make the information available. It's called Proceedings of the Scientific and Technical Congress of Radionics and Radiesthesia, London, May 16th to 18th, 1950. And radiesthesia, we pretty much know what radionics are. Radiesthesia is sort of a general term for dousing radiations of plants, minerals, whatever. So we can say radionics is dealing with equipment and rubbing plates. And radiesthesia deals with pendulums, although as we're going to see, the British were some of the first to really begin using pendulums rather than the actual stick plate. But this is an excellent book. It contains articles by J. Cecil Maybe, Michael Ash, Ellie Eman, George Delawire, and uh, many, many others. others. Um, and this book is available through Borderland for people who are interested in serious research and what was happening over in, on the European continent. About, About 40 years ago. I believe Marguerite Maury also has a lecture in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. E.A. Maury Paris. And in uh, Murray Denning's book that we showed earlier, My Search for Radionic Truths, he brings that out as one of the principal books in his learning on how to douse. And we have some Xeroxes of some of the pages where she talks about the different spins on the different fingers and how to douse out magnets. So this, in this uh, first, one of the opening lectures here, This Medicatrix Nature by Aubrey Westlake is just an excellent article on the actual force that heals. So overall, this is a real primary book for people who are interested in radionics and its ramifications. Right. One of the other things we don't have here is uh, Westlake's book called Pattern of Hell. A well, top flight book published by Shambhala here, but also by other publishers. I believe it's out of print at this point. So the next thing we wanted to show, I don't think this, this hinge doesn't come down. Anyway, this... No. This is one of the first style of radionic type devices that doesn't have a stick plate, but instead has uh, a twin pendulum plate system, so that the detection method used with this is a pendulum as opposed to a, a rubbing plate. And this is a Copen, uh, Dr. Bruce Copen, uh, Model Y portable, uh, probably built in the mid-70s. And um, it, has a sm it has a small battery in it that uh, also uh, turns on the light. But it also, um, you can attach the battery through the radionic tuning. And in this way, it has a tendency of tuning the system to your witness, which is placed on one of these plates, which is what he calls the fundamental ray tuning. Right. In his instruments that didn't have electricity, he had a knob for tuning the fundamental ray to make sure you got the direction. And then they introduced the single wire connection, even though two wires plugged into the wall, a single wire would connect. And in this portable unit, you have a battery. And the sole use of this switch here is just to test that the battery is still good and the light's not on during operation. It's brought on through that. Right. So the, the battery acted as a source of energy which had a tendency of aligning the vibrations in, in the circuitry. And what we want to do is we want to just open this thing up. The other thing uh, that Copen introduced were these two dials, which um, are called the over-function and under-function dials. You could uh, tune up a rate, and he, um, he numbered his dials from from the back, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you dial up your rates backwards from one through nine so that the upper dials were not used. So he developed a whole rate system as well. And once you had the rate, for instance, if you, if you uh, dial up the rate for somebody's heart, you would get a pendulum indication that would be oblique in some way and then you would compensate the, the angle of, of the pendulum movement with the over or under function dial until you got a, a straight up and down movement which would break into a counter or a, a clockwise circle motion which, get, which meant that you were exactly on the right tuning and then that would give you a reading of how 
much under function of that organ was operating. So if it was, uh, in this case, 30% under function, that meant your, your heart, in this case, was uh, only operating at 70% its normal energy. And what we can see here, this is a lot of just wires, but basically what we have here are variable, uh, a variable resistor. And uh, many of the systems that we had seen before were actually position switches that had a, a, um, a, a resistor or a resistance wire fixed, fixed to stages. each of the positions. Here we've moved now to a variable resistor which has a clean sweep of changing resistances all the way up and down. And actually his units would go above the 10 point. And sometimes um, that made also a useful tuning. Right, it has its advantages and disadvantages depending on how you learn the systems and what exactly you were trying to do. Exactly. In the Ruth Drown system, uh, it was desired to have the clicks to make the distinction to really tune in precisely that way. But then there's also there would be times when you would want to get in between too. Exactly. So both systems have their advantage and their uses, and it really all depends on the operator and their familiarity and uh, skill in using the system. So in this system, the the pendulum plates are uh, at the extremes of the uh, dials and uh, you, um, you get a reading uh, on the pendulum. Here, here's, here's, here's one of the pendulums. So in a situation like this where this is not tuned to anything, you, you would look for a, a movement that would fundamentally break into a counter or a clockwise circle like this which basically gave you the indication that the energy field on both of those plates was identical. And the minute you turn one of the knobs, if you turn just one of the knobs, what starts happening is that it starts breaking out of that pattern into some oblique angular movement, such as that. I'd like to say this unit here, and I've worked with various Ruth Drown, all the Ruth Drown equipment that we've seen here, I've tried working all of that and have never been able to get a stick on a plate. But using this instrument here, this is actually the first one I've ever been able to get a real reaction off of. And by tuning the dials and getting the change in the pendulum, really? it was a very uh, thrilling experience for me to experience it after having read and studied it for years. Exactly. Copen was generally um, ostracized from the British Society of Dowsers and, uh, and radionicists, mainly because he sold equipment at a reasonable price, which made them available to a lot of different people, and he would sell them with instrument handbooks, giving you complete instructions on how to operate these things, and he wouldn't charge you an arm and a leg for them. Uh, Bruce Copen has, uh, has been, a, catalog. Oh, has been catalog. A, an absolutely prolific um, writer and inventor, and uh, this is one of the early, early catalogs. Right, here's a lot of books that were written. So many different types of pendulums. Color, heal color healing filters, solar therapy sheets, radiation rectifier. I've worked with the radiation rectifier. It's a spectacular device. Here's the Model Y, which is the big one, which we're looking at the portable. Here's the rate sheets, which you can scan up and down with a slide that rather than dialing in the rate, you could actually find it in the book. And we have with this a little attachment that goes in the side. This, now this is a little rate indicator that you would just plug into the side, which then attached to the first um, thing. And then you could just use this to point at a rate and get a pendulum movement directly without having to change the dials. And so this is how you would do a preliminary uh, diagnosis. Um, and then if you wanted to um, harden that, um, that uh, situation, you could dial the rate up on the dial without pointing this out and, and, uh, and get your fine tuning with the over and under function dials. Mm -hmm. Let me show a couple other of his instruments here and we'll give the address out of the catalog, which I believe is still current. Mm -hmm. 
Here we see a diagnostic broadcaster, very similar to the one we have. And then here is the one we're looking at, the Model Y miniature diagnostic broadcaster. There's also one that's not, uh, not pictured, there's more listings. Radionic prospecting and analysis instrument. You see they're all variations of the same basic structure. The hypnoid, improved method of hypnosis. Vibronic energizer. And uh, very interesting things, but here's here's his address. Oh no, this is not the correct address. Oh, this is an old address. Yeah, this is an old old. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have the uh, his his address is uh, Bruce Copen, Doctor Bruce Copen, Highfield, Dane Hill, Sussex, England. And the zip is capital R, capital H, 17-7EX. Sounds like Dane Hill, Sussex, is what I remembered. Yeah. Um. So the... Um, so Copen is credited with a number of developments. One, he was uh, one of the first to go to the pendulum system. He was also using a variable resistive bank. And also, um, uh, he developed extensive rate books, which were organized, probably the, the first really decent organization of a rate book I've ever seen. And he also made these things available to the general public. Many of the other laboratories through the 60s and 70s, um, you, you had to spend thousands of dollars for training, then thousands of dollars for equipment, and the average person just couldn't get into this. Copen, on the other hand, uh, would sell you highly useful equipment for a few hundred dollars, and you could buy as many books as you wanted. Uh, and he single-handedly um, put radionics in the hands of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He also sold uh, uh, correspondence courses if you really wanted to um, learn a lot more about it. He would actually give you graded tests, et cetera, on, ra on radionics uh, developments and would guide you every step of the way. So Copen is um, certainly one of the, the big names uh, in the European developments and um, is still uh, putting out spectacular equipment. And uh, point out that of all the equipment we've seen so far, other than the Ukeko device, which you don't particularly care for. This is the first usable piece still in operation that we've been That's looking right. at here. You could probably buy a model that's very similar to this um, today from Copen. Okay. The next development we want to show you um, was also developed in England in the, in the 60s and the 70s. Oh, I should pendulum out. Yeah. I'll get another one. And uh, this is uh, this is the first and major kind of departure or major change. Uh, this system was developed by a gentleman named Malcolm Ray, and the analysis um, he had two boards like this, which are like a gigantic stick plate, except. He had this diagram on them, which he used with a pendulum. So you would place the patient's witness in this circle here, and then from there you would put the pendulum over that and determine where it went so you, want, you could find out immediately which type of situation you needed to treat, which was the, the most important thing as far as which of these categories on this analysis thing. So if it was, depending on how, uh, whether it was uh, involved in the fluids or um, this, anything that was listed here or anything that was listed here or anything that was listed in here, you would easily get a indication of which one to go to. And then once you knew which section you were going to, then you'd put the pendulum here and it would radiate and out in one of these directions and that would tell you what to start looking at. Then you could, um, then you could find out whether or not, um, he's also got uh, intensity 
percentage here of 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 100. So you could get a lot of different indications with this. This was his um, basic system of analysis. Then he had a second plate here that was for treatment. And you place the, the witness here again, and then you'd find out whether or not you should be using gems or light or color or uh, Bach flower remedies or homeopathy or whether the person should fast or get vitamins or so on. He had a lot of different things, whether you should use surgery or uh, manipulation or acupuncture. He even has one for allopathy. Some people need that. Yep, some people need that. And um, then if he needed something that, was res that resembled a uh, homeopathic style remedy, you could find out uh, what potency he needed, whether they should take it orally or they should broadcast it with the device or whether they should rub it in the skin or how, how it should be applied and then how many times and when, hours, days, weeks and so on. So this, this system um, well, had a very, very different um, set of ways of tuning into these systems and he used a, a pendulum with these extensive charts. Then this device, you would, you would tune the device to a particular organ or part of the body, etc. not by using a variable resistor bank that had a rate or a variable capacitor bank that had a rate as we've seen in all the other devices. But Malcolm Ray, using his pendulum, and a yardstick that had 360 degree, 360 even uh, divisions, developed this system of cards. Each one of these cards has a number of what are called partial radii poking into the center. Every, this one is for the physical etheric body. This one represents um, every cell in the body that is a cell. So this represents if the, a system, if like something at the cellular level is, is disrupted, this will tune right. to it. We should point out there's different slots in here for factor, location, and correction. So you could be looking for, at the cellular level and then go back. Go back to the pendulum plate, etc. So that these, ca these cards, which represented a tuning, a specific set of rates, for instance, would simply be slipped into one of these slots. And this is what created the tuning in the Malcolm Ray system. Or we have the general cards here. There was literally hundreds and hundreds of these there were, cards. There were thousands of these cards, actually. actually. This one usually goes here when you're testing as symptoms of disorder. Right. This into the factor. Right. Well used card there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and if there was a card in here, you would turn that, sis that system on that would move to this. So now what we've seen over the development this is a, a, a major departure in style. Um, this system, I've worked with this symbolic system um, over the years, and I have found uh, that these uh, cards uh, work really wonderfully uh, as far as a, a system of tuning. I built a device myself, uh, which we've seen in other uh, videos, like radionics and natural healing video, uh, which had variable resistive, variable capacitive, and, and symbolic systems all built into the circuitry, so I could use any of those modalities. And um, I find these uh, very easy to use and very effective. I used this for analysis for a while, and uh, use these, we have the treatment box here, it's called the Ray Potencies simulator and uh, this had electromagnetic pulses going through it and a card oh, so you had a card for Bach flower remedy or homeopathic and this would go in there the witness would go in here and you could then there was a, a conversion factor between the numbers here and the potency that you were raising it to so you would if you wanted to raise it to 1m potency or something like that you dial up a certain number that was in a catalog Right. What I found over time, just by checking my records, not because anybody I was trying this on, volunteers, 
never really responded as to what was happening, but I would just go through and do several people a day on a list of about 30. And after checking over months of time, even though I didn't have any independent verification of anything was working, I did find, by going back and looking through, finding I was getting very similar readings on the people over time with just slight variations in the treatment cards and mm -hmm. potencies. So did you feel it worked or didn't work? I, I felt that I was detecting something. Mm -hmm. that I, was, I was definitely working on the detection. Whether or not um, it was really working, I really don't know because the people, this was what Riley Crabb had set up when he was running Borderland. And when I took over, I was running it for a while that way. Mm -hmm. And it was what he called his prayer list. And I just carried on for a while as an experiment. And I did find that without going back and knowing what I had done on the person you know, a week earlier, that I would get very similar readings over time. Mm -hmm. So that was my only verification of it. So in your analysis, even though you didn't pull somebody's record, when you compared what you just got right. to what you had well, gotten before, mm -hmm. it looked real similar. Right. But a lot of witnesses, <clears throat> you know, it was like, oh, you know, Mubarak and... Uh, Shimon Perez, and it was all world leaders. Riley used to clip out everybody he thought needed help and mm -hmm. do it. So, um. Bless his heart. <laughs> anyway, I, I've worked, I know a number of people who've worked with this system um, and had very good results. Um, and I've used variations on this in my own equipment and, um, and, and like it a lot. The, the important thing here is that um, now we've uh, demonstrated, we've shown the evolution of a whole line of equipment, uh, which started with uh, Dr. Abrams running a glass rod on a person's abdomen, right. and now we've developed into something very sophisticated, and we've gone through a wide variety of different devices. We haven't shown you any variable capacity devices, but I do know that uh, the Hieronymus devices were some of the finest ever made, and uh, with, with spectacular results. And it's still being made. They're and still being made today at the address we gave earlier for the book exactly. on Hieronymus. And um, um, one of the other things is uh, this this type of equipment was well documented in a series of books by David Tansley. Who Here, also died last year, <laughs> the year that many radionicists died. died. To be in the, the in crowd, everybody was dying last year. Um, Here's uh, one of his better books, in my estimation, called Radionics, Science or Magic, where he talks about what is radionics. He really gets into the question of why this hasn't been um, accepted by modern science and, uh, and how that's related to whether or not it works <laughs> and, uh, and so on. Um, these have been bestsellers in the radionics uh, uh, name list for s many, many years now, at least over 10 years. Yeah, I wanted to uh, also, just as an anecdotal input here, while we're talking about the British uh, school, here's some pictures from Murray Denning's book in My Search for Radionic Truths, and he shows some instruments in here that really aren't known anywhere else. And... Uh, now, these seem to be... Sh Basically, These were created by a man named Daryl Butcher, and they basically worked on spirals, and he was working towards automatic instruments, so I'm not truly sure how they operated. He's more documenting their existence here, rather than really showing how they were developed. And we see on this curved piece, there's a carving in it, and the carving here is more plainly seen. Here, it's a... Uh, Looks somewhat logarithmic, not really sure, but here's another meter. And these are various, these things spun on some type of axes. And he made a board called the Pegody board where he would move pieces around. And here's a Pegody board that had a little spinning thing. And Denning talks about how he would go out the room and look in the window to see if it was turning and it still would be. So apparently this was worked towards automatic radionics in England. This is a very little known aspect of the British Radionic School. And here's one called the Straw Hat, spun around and had different witness cards on it also. So there's not very much technical data in this book, but in uh, just a few pages in Murray's uh, book, he 
those document that those existed. So it's, from a historical standpoint, I thought it was good to mention. Mm -hmm. So basically, what what we've seen so far is a an idea here which started that there are certain subtle emanations coming from the human body which can be detected in a number of ways that they you can develop devices to help eliminate all the other tunings and focus uh, one particular type of emanation through a through a type of circuitry that we can use to isolate it from all the others and then detect it in some way and, and interact with it in another way uh, for treatment. One, the detecting of it is what we would call the analysis, the interacting with it hopefully in a beneficial way we would call a treatment, and that this was the basic radionic mode. What we found over the years is that a number of different types of circuitry, and finally uh, the the development of no circuitry at all was um, has evolved. It started with a sequence of, of resistances. It moved to um, a sequence of, of variable capacitances, and then moved entirely to what we'll call um, a, a sequences of symbols. Right. There's no power in this instrument. No battery. No nothing. Right. The switches. It just they, they just connect, you know, a plate that's standing in front of this with the rest of the circuit. So these are all very passive situations. Right. And now radionics, you know, deals with radiations. And in modern days, a lot of people go towards an explanation which is termed psychotronics, which implies that it's the intent of the operator. Now, an article that Trevor Constable wrote for the journal in... 1961 or 1962 on the Ruth drum system, he points out how essential it is to keep for the operator to not project thought forms into the equipment because at our state of human development it can alter the outcome and that the drum system specifically in his article works with the radiations and the thought process is kept out so that the psychotronic explanations that are going around today well, they are valid, and you can manipulate these instruments with the thought process. That's not the primary use of them, and it wasn't how it was primarily developed, and in essence should be kept out of it, because when you're dealing with, when you get to the structure, you're still not imprinting your mind on it. You're dealing with a specific energy that's coming from the structure. Mm -hmm. So far we've gone through the historical development of the various devices that have been used to detect uh, emanations from human beings, which is basically the study of radionics. We've also seen some of the devices that have been used for broadcasting for agricultural use. Basically this whole field of the subtle detection and interaction of subtle emanations in the living energy fields around light, uh, humans and plants uh, dates back uh, many, many thousands of years. And before the advent of the development of the devices which were used for tuning, there were a wide variety of what we'll call detection devices that um, were used throughout the many ages. We've seen how uh, radionics started with a, uh, a rubbing plate method and also incorporated later uh, the use of the pendulum. But the pendulum isn't the only thing that has been classically used over the ages for subtle detection. We've had a number of other major developments. But for instance, this is what you could consider a basic pendulum. It's some shape, some form of material hanging on, on a chain or a, or a wire that will swing in a certain motion.
have also been basically what it does too when it swings is the pendulum itself isn't swinging independently of the hand it's actually an amplifier of the hand's subtle motions and reactions to external radiations coming in whether it be from plant animal or mineral or thought or emotion so basically what this is used as is an external indicator of what the person operating it is actually picking up from his environment oftentimes the person who uses a detection uh, device like a pendulum doesn't give themselves permission to know directly what the information that's impinging upon them really is which would be simply called intuition or realization so that these subtle methods were developed over the ages to give people permission to know what they shouldn't have been able to know Here's a couple publications of the many publications we make available to researchers. This here is a dowsing dictionary by Janice Bayless and Adrian Bartlow. And this is really an excellent book for the beginner or the expert. Um, it's basically a dictionary of dowsing. And it's available through Borderland and I believe American Society of Dowsers and many other sources. Um, a lot of bookstores, Sun Man Moon, Huntington Beach, California. So that's a good one. Any dowser should have that on their shelf. Just to they find something they can't uh, remember, they can look it up. Here's one published by Health Research, Elementary Radiesthesia and the Use of the Pendulum, which radiesthesia is the general science of detection through pendulum and related uh, types of objects. The pendulum's not only swinging, but as we see, there'll be um, not just uh, the vertical, but there's also horizontal variations of it. It's developed by Vern Cameron and, and swing rods. This is another basic book, and here's another good one, which I've actually seen in a lot of bookstores. This is also published by Health Research, How to Use a Pendulum. Just basic, simple lessons for people that want to find out and try. You're, be honest with you, you don't need a book. All you need is just pick up a nut out of... Out of uh, your old workshop, stick a, put it on a string, yeah. and you've got a pendulum. That's it, and you're going to see my collection of pendulums here and see you know, a wide variety can be constructed and configured. Uh, here, uh, it gets into the various movements so that the pendulum can take, a clockwise circle, a counterclockwise circle, vertical or horizontal. Or no value, no gyration. No gyration at all, or or ellipses and so on. I've got many complex readings and uh, as I go through these pendulums here I'll talk about some of the more novel readings I've gotten from pendulums. And also the book goes into how to interpret these various movements. Right, basically you set up a system that you agree with and once you understand that that's it and you're in relation with your pendulum it's pretty easy to carry on. Um, One of the things we wanted to go on beyond pendulums is just a discussion of some of the other detectors that people have used. Reflection. Um, this, one. this one's called Techniques of Swing Rod Dowsing. This is by Bill Cox, who is um, down in Santa Barbara, California, Life Understanding Foundation, and we carry all their books and their devices through Borderland. And this is this particular one on swing rod dowsing. Now here, here's your basic set of swing rods. This is just a uh, little couple pieces of wood that you hold in your hand and the rod then swings. You can even just take a coat hanger and make an L shape and let it swing in your hand. And you can go along with it and when you cross the field it may cross like this or it may push apart. You can use a single one for direction finding if you're like trying to locate a lost person in a field. Various uses, it depends on your relationship with the system you've uh, accepted for readings. And then we have a nice set here which has been developed by Bill Cox, uh, Swing Rods, and this has another little uh, swing system here. These are real nice ones. These are nice balance and they're light and compact and the hand can't grip them or move them. So they are, they're allowed to swing independently. 
probably not going to get real profound readings up here in this tight little space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, what it is is a person can manipulate these and make them do whatever they want. And in essence, that's what you're doing anyway, I feel. It's just that you have to have that conscious detachment from mm -hmm. your senses. If you did have a conscious attachment and use them, then you really wouldn't use a pendulum. And I don't really use one myself anymore, so these are all a collection I've put together in my development probably over the last 15 years of using a pendulum. What's nice about uh, a device like a swing rod like this, for instance, um, is that if you want to use this to detect something that you basically feel that you're not personally sensitive enough to detect without the device and you really and your intention is to really do it you really have to get to a no thought space where you're simply holding an intention and you're just waiting to see what happens that's the attitude and that's the kind of the state of mind of the operator where you really start getting good results mm -hmm. because you can make these I can I can make this thing point at Tom I can make it point at Allison or you know, the camera I can make it point at me just by changing the angle of my wrist so that's no big that's no big deal right. so what what is important here is that that basic subtle nerve impulses in my hands will respond to various things that I'm thinking and allow information that is in a nonverbal state to come out in a way that's more physical that I can interpret in a way that I'll can understand verbally in my mind. Right, so while you can manipulate that consciously, you can also find, you know, like water that's underground, an underground stream, which, you know, consciously you don't know if it's there, and people do it, and they pay hundreds of dollars, or you know, sometimes thousands, to bring in drilling wells, and they find it right where people find them with these, so they have a proven track record. Right. So one of the things we don't have is a, a, a water, a, a water witch. Right, uh, divining, divining rod. Which you can just get a forked stick off of a tree. Right, which can also give you uh, very interesting indications. It's another classic. Here's a book published by Borderland. Really our only dousing book we publish. All the rest we carry from other publishers. And this is a Cameron orometer based on the work of Vern Cameron, which is now being carried on by Bill Cox. And here's a Cameron orometer, which was built by Bill Cox, Life Understanding Foundation. It has a swivel tip on it, and uh, it's basically spring-loaded. And the reason it's called orometer is because you can delineate the aura of a person's body. You can come close. And not really getting a reading now, but yeah, a little bit pushing away. I don't know if I'm doing that consciously right now, because when you're filming a video, you're really not in a state of mind. You're dousing on aura, with all the lights are on and everything. And uh, you can use the tip for map dousing, going along on a map. You can use it for finding water, underground water. So it's a combination pendulum. You can get, you see how deep it is by how many times this will go. You can count out how, how deep is this, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. 40 feet. And once you have a system that you accept, this is a very versatile and useful tool. This is a particularly sensitive device. It is. It, you can hardly make a move without it moving in one direction. And Vern Cameron was a longtime member of Borderland Sciences, and uh, this book was actually started by Mead Lane back in the 50s. And here's, you know, Mead Lane's aura, how it is. In brain radiation. So. It's another interesting book about a, a detection method that basically uses no types of what would be considered, you know, a black box. Right. And here's another orometer which was made by a group called the Redland Study Group. And uh, it's not a bad little unit. It doesn't have a swivel tip. And uh, that's just another one in the collection. Nice little unit to use. It's made out of copper. So these are among the different styles. Mm -hmm. And now we want to just go through briefly um, some of the almost infinite variations. We're, we're showing, in this case, a collection of pendulums uh, for detection. Uh, but 
you could uh, you could just as easily go through a sequence of swing rods and so on, which uh, would show almost as much variation. Right. There's a lot more things that are available to dowsers that we don't have here. Mm -hmm. But here's one which we're using on the Malcolm Ray and the Bruce Copen equipment, which is a cavity pendulum. Has a hole in it where you can place a substance that you want to try and tune into. For instance, if you want to map douse for gold, you could put a little gold in that slot. Right, and you may not go over the map with the pendulum. You just have a pointer, like we showed you, point at the rates. Just point around on the map. And you know, don't feel bad about starting the swing. You know, the thing might not start swinging by itself, so you might want to start to swing yourself and then, and then, watch then, what then let it go where it's going. Right. So that's one. I have one made out of clear plastic like that, which I've used a diagram of the Hieronymus instrument in. And that's the one that I have been able to find for about a year out of my collection. And I hope someday to come across it again. Okay, so one of the basic variations is that you can put a, a, an empty space inside of a pendulum and use it to tune to various substances that you would place in there. Right. You can also put a substance in the well of an orometer too infinite variations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just run through these briefly. Here's another pendulum made by Bill Cox, Life Understanding. It's polished quartz crystal on chain. Very nice little versatile one. And we also carry amethyst pendulums made by Bill Cox. Very popular little pendulum. Here's one made out of a key that I made for dousing out lost objects. It's just a simple key and since a key as a symbol in my mind of lost objects that this one is. And I should probably use it to try to find my other pendulum, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> um, here's an interesting pair of pendulums. If Peter can hold up the other one. These are crystal, this quartz crystal, probably silver chain. What's interesting about these is if I get a clockwise reaction with one of the pendulums, the other one gives me the opposing polarity, showing that these two crystals have an opposing polarity. That's something to keep in mind if you are using a crystal pendulum. If you, you, know, you may have, have a certain set of reactions you're used to, but you get different ones with the crystal. So it's something that should be checked and kept in mind. And here's an Austrian crystal. The others were natural crystal. This it's is probably leaded glass. Yeah, leaded cut glass crystal. This, this is all on monofilament fish line. Very easy to make. A lot of people have these crystals around. And they're fun to hang in the window too. The sun comes through and sends out spectrums. Okay. Here's another little basic one, just a little metallic point, and uh, the holding point on it is just a little piece of polished stone. Nice little comfortable one to use. Also easy to carry like in a watch pocket. This one I never really used, but I put it in the collection, and it's uh, basically what this is, is um, an old Chinese weapon. It's a throwing, it's called a shuriken. And um, like a throwing knife, although this one's not sharp, it's really ornamental and has a dragon on it. And I thought about using it like for going up and finding acupuncture points on the body. Although it's a literal, little elaborate, you know, for a collection standpoint, it's an interesting piece. And when we hold these two up together, here's two, both made out of wood with thread and fish line. You just get different types of swings and weights from different shapes. So it's something to experiment with if a person's looking for an optimum pendulum. You get much broader swings and circles with this type here than you do with this. It's a more precision point. So there's a lot of variations in that. Um, there's, a, there's a really simple one. It's just a piece of stone that right. we just drilled a hole in. No, that's a natural hole. That's a natural hole? It's a natural hole. And this one is used for like dousing out like earth lines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for working in the elemental range. And also in the elemental range, we have this little pendulum here, which is filled with lithium. What, do, you, do you know what type of... This is mineral? lapidolite from uh, the Stewart Lithium Mines in uh, Paula, California. Okay. So that's encased in a little glass uh, teardrop type shape with a little gold covered chain. Right. And... Um, Here's once a little radio tube with a piece of fish line. And this is used for 
dousing out old electrical schematics or old electrical equipment where you don't have the schematic and you're trying to find something because it's symbolic has a symbolic relationship to the thing you're working on and here's a pendulum this development of a slide on the pendulum came about through Dr. Christopher Hills. This pendulum was originally a Christopher Hills pendulum with the seven colors of the rainbow for dousing the chakras of the body. But I don't particularly go along with the chakra relationship and the colors as they're presented to the spectrum. I believe is a much more complex and fundamental, that's much complex but different and fundamental setup of the colors in the body. So anyway, you changed the color. I changed the colors. This is basically mandala detector because I'm going to show some of the work I've done with mandala detecting. And the mandala basically it's a symbol of the range of consciousness or four stages of you know dawn, midday, dusk, and night. And it's an archetypal forest structure. Here we have for dawn blue, for midday yellow, for sunset, red, and for nighttime, green. We have black at one end and white at the other. And this was used uh, over 10 years ago for a lot of work I did with Tibetan mandalas and trying to detect the fields. And then detect the relationships of other objects, you know, how they actually fit in to that field. Which is the basic science of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is learning how to uh, interact with all these fields and understand them so you don't get lost when you die and you're no longer grounded to the fields and all the energies are flying at you. And here's an interesting one. This has a little coil around it down to a point. And I've never really used this one. This belonged to Riley Crab. And it's just another interesting one that could be used for probably detecting a certain type of energy. Here's another similar one. This is a similar one. This has a cavity in it also. It's made out of a bullet casing, I believe, and has a little s spiral. This is made by a man named Reed Selseth in Chicago, made an art class, and gave it to me many years ago. Um, and here's another one. This has some kind of charge in it. I can't remember what it is. It's some kind of semiconductor witness. And it has a little point on it. It's another one that belonged to Riley Crabb. These are just some of the ones in the archives here. Right. Here's another one from Christopher Hills. It's a cube, and it has a little witness also inside. And what this one's for is for testing saline content of foods. Or is there salt in there? In that? I believe it is salt. I can't recall exactly now. It's been many, many years. But basically for testing the you know, it's crystalline structure. And uh, in finality here on my collection. Here's one I made which I call a Dorje pendulum. Now what a Dorje is, here's one uh, Tibetan ritual implement which um, shows like physical and etheric, you know, with the spirit in the middle, the seed. And this was also used in mandala testing and work for detecting fields of the body and whatever. And this is wound of five coils, all four inches long, I believe it was four winds each around a four inch piece, and then they were shaped and the middle coil is just a random number of turns to hold it together. And uh, we're talking about mandalas just to briefly show one. Here is a Tibetan mandala which rightly goes this way with blue for east, dawn, yellow, south, Sun overhead. It's red reflecting. West. Reflecting. Okay. It's bitter. Red for west and sunset and green for nighttime and north. And what I would do with these pendulums like this is I would see what kind of reading I would get from a particular sector of the mandala. And then I would test various objects or symbols of experiences I was going through at the time and test the relationship. So I built up a complex set of readings on this, which I won't give out to anybody because anybody that would want to get into this would have to develop their own to really get any use out of it. And these things, you know, forms and shapes do generate energy. As we know, here's a little pendulum, or I'm sorry, a pyramid block. I've also done extensive testing of pyramids with pendulums, and you find it over different sections, like in between you get 
clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, and they're always interrelated. And uh, so basically, here's a here's the Borderland collection of various types of subtle energy detectors, which right. have been used throughout many, many years. All right, I like to say, in closing on this, that I don't really use any of these pendulums anymore. I haven't used them much for years, but I still do a lot of what I consider dousing. That's in my editing of the Journal of the Borderland Research, which here's the current issue, January, February, 89. There's a form on the cover from uh, Patrick Flanagan, Archetypal Vortex, which could probably, energies could, of different types could be doused off of that. And the way articles go into here, I get loads of mail, more than any human could possibly read, with, even with a staff of five, which we don't have. And I judge what goes into here by feel. How does the envelope feel in my hand? I pull things out of the mail, I say, yeah, this one here, it's going in. And that's how I judge what, how it goes in. So I don't use a pendulum, I just use my fingers and how things feel. So I've developed to that point as far as my general detection. So actually, um, this, this took a lot more time than we thought, so this is actually the end of part one. Of our tour of the Borderland Museum. And in part two, we're going to cover our extensive electrotherapeutic, color therapy, uh, the work of Ellie Eman and Peter Lindemann's uh, modern work in that, and pretty much try to wrap this all up. Um, so you got a couple more hours coming and uh, thank you for sitting here with us.